Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started here in a, just a few seconds. If you want to grab chairs. Well, welcome, everyone, uh, to the uh, third event in our uh, Bob and Elizabeth Dole series on leadership. Um, the purpose of this whole exercise is to call on leaders from national and local government, from the business community, advocacy, arts, to try to help us understand what are the characteristics that um, enable true leaders. You know, what are the circumstances and skills that allow some people to overcome obstacles and try to unite diverse interests despite the conflict that is appropriate and inevitable in any democracy. We led the series off, series off with two real great political thinkers, with George Mitchell and David Gergen, and our goal was to anchor the question of the state of politics in DC. And today, session really begins to um, address that broader aspiration to move beyond Washington, to bring together people who have diverse experiences at you know, high levels of leadership, to see what kinds of insights we might be able to draw into our own political conversation. Our guest, Lowell McAdam, uh, is the current chairman and the very recent former CEO of Verizon Communications. Lowell has held a variety of leadership roles in his 20 years at Verizon. He was named CEO of Verizon Wireless in 2006 and the parent company, Verizon Communications, in 2012. To me, I think equally significant is that Lowell has been on the vanguard of this wireless transition since the early days in the 1980s. And so as I said to him earlier, I think therefore he deserves some credit for the democratization of data for Wikipedia, WebMD, and some responsibility for the lack of interpersonal contact, <laughs> candy crush, and um, the challenge in my household right now, which is called Fortnite. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the goal today is to try to really explore you know, the challenges and the you know, gratification of leading a high-profile, consumer-facing company, which has gone through incredibly dynamic changes in terms of technology, in workforce. You've made some pretty bold acquisitions. You have led a company through a global economic crisis, and then also some very significant and shifting expectations on the role of corporate leaders in broader societal questions and debates. And also just kind of emblematic of Lowell's commitment and interest in broader public policy issues, uh, he spent a few years co-chairing an effort here at the BPC, which was a CEO council on health and innovation, which sought to evaluate and then ultimately encourage innovative strategies that improve employee health and the delivery of health services that are more cost effective and more sustainable. And so that is an effort that we greatly appreciate. Um, finally, just before we begin the discussion, I want to um, remind you all that we are really proud to have named the series in honor of the extraordinary service of Bob and Elizabeth Dole. Both are proud partisans who over long careers overcame real adversity and demonstrated the confidence and the creativity to actually dignify differences and build coalitions that have changed the country for the better. And so it is in their spirit and in their example that we um, start this discussion. I guess finally, finally, I will note that um, one key aspect of leadership is just showing up. Lowell has a little bit of laryngitis, um, which uh, came from a significant speaking tour which ended in New Orleans. Um, he claims it was just the speaking that uh, did him in, and we will not explore that further. Um, but uh, if this is a little sotto voce, um, I hope you'll understand. All right, so um, at the last event with David Gergen, there was a lot of discussion about institutions and what are the role of institutions in enabling leadership. And there was a lot of focus on the military and some optimism that the number of veterans running um, will provide leaders who have been through a kind of mixing bowl of geography and economy and different personality. Um, and I know that you um, spent some time in your early life in the Navy. And wonder if you just reflect on whether you know, that experience has stayed with you or what, what, you know, what have been the early influences that you ascribe some of your leadership traits to. All right, well, thank, thank you, Jason. And 
I'll start out by saying I'm the guy that sits next to you on an airplane and says, you know, I sound bad, I really don't feel bad, and then the next day you come down with a cold. So <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, project enough here and make it through our, our, uh, our time together. You, you know, Jason, as I thought about this, I think it's, it's, uh, was, my youth was extremely important to me, more so than I, I realized. And, um, I'm a fan of Steve Jobs, and when he gave that Stanford speech about when you look back on your life and you see how the dots ended up connecting and getting you where you are, I've really thought a lot about that. And um, I grew up in a very rural community. There were 500 people in my town. My entire graduating class had 72 people in it. And um, it was a farming community, and my family made farm machinery. Well, my my um, my jobs from I think I was probably eight or ten uh, was literally going out and picking fruit. So I can tell you how to pick cherries and strawberries and blueberries and all that stuff. And you worked right alongside the migrant workers that came. We had a whole group that came in from Puerto Rico. And uh, you know, don't ask me to speak any Spanish at this point in life. But you know, you learned to communicate with them. You saw how they lived, you saw what their life was like, and from a very early age, I was like, my God, I am so blessed. And I think um, that carried with me um, into my time in the Navy. The Navy put me through school, and they, um, you, went to, um, you went on these summer camps, if you will, and the first couple of years, you were treated as an enlisted man. So I was on board ship, assigned to clean out the bilges of a destroyer. And you're, if you've ever been in the bilge of a destroyer, you don't want to be there. Uh, but you were right beside a guy who, that was his career. He had to do that stuff. And my first view of leadership was from his perspective. You know, you and I can talk about leadership. It doesn't mean anything. It's what are the people that you're leading? What are they, what are they looking for out of you? And I, that helped me a lot. And my first uh, assignment, I was in the Seabees, and I love the Seabees because we're a little bit undisciplined. We, our motto is can do. It should be we do whatever it takes to get it done. Sometimes you're a little embarrassed by what you do. But, but um, I was on a detachment that had two officers and 200 enlisted people. And yeah, you have the authority of the, the gold bar on your shoulder, but to get those guys to do what you want them to do, especially in an environment that wasn't as disciplined as, say, the Marines, um, you had to learn how to be communicate your vision, tell them why you were doing what you were doing, get them motivated, and get them to respect you. And you know, I had a uh, I had a lot of people that took me under their wing, and um, you know, I had a master chief. Now here I am, an Ivy League graduate. I show up in Guam. I've got this master chief working for me. I pretty quickly realized I was actually working for him. But, uh, but he took me, he said, you want to play racquetball? You, know, you think you're good at this stuff? He took me out and he kicked my butt on the racquetball court for like six months before I finally beat him once. But you, you learned, you know, we'd always sit down, have a beer, and he'd talk about leadership. And you know, those are the things that made, made a big difference. So I, um, I'm a fan, uh, by the way, I'm going to be retired in January, so I'm at the point where I don't have to be politically correct anymore. You know, I, um, I wish we had a mandatory service of some type for people to go out of high school and go into VISTA or the Peace Corps or the military the way they do it in Israel. I think it would, get, it would knock people off their sort of, uh, I'm an Ivy Leaguer, and I only say that because I was one, I am one. Um, I think it would make people be a little bit more humble and be a little less arrogant in their views and be um, and understand what it takes to really lead people and, and do the right thing, not for you personally, but for your organization or your country. Yeah, that, well, that's a, that is a resonant idea we've heard a lot uh, in our Commission on Political Reform, actually led by Dan Glickman. This is one of the proposals, and I think the real question is the mechanics. Uh, it's something I hope we can uh, continue to work on. Um, so let's just, you know, long career. What, you know, when you look back, you know, what are some of the bigger challenges um, that you faced while you were leading a small group of 150,000 people? Yeah. 
It was 210 when we started, and now it's 150. So it uh, shows you that's one of the one of the big changes you have to go through. You know, I, I think for a for a CEO, the technology is changing so rapidly. You know, when um, I was fortunate enough to be in Los Angeles when we did the Olympics and we had the very first cell phone. You know, I mean, the call was in Chicago, but the first application was really the Olympics and. You know, we were on analog from the middle of the 80s. We were just coming off analog in 99 when we started Verizon, you know, maybe 96 is when we started. So those were the kind of cycles that you were on. You know, we introduced four, our, you know, the one we're on now, 4G, about six years ago, and now we're right on the cusp. We've already launched commercially 5G. So. Technology changes have been so dramatic, and you know you alluded to your fascination with Candy Crush, and now we'll look at you in that, or was it something else? But anyway, <laughs> you, you, I mean, you look at um, you look at the changes in people's lives and the the obligation that you feel for that, and I, I've used the term 5G is going to be the next, the fourth industrial revolution. If you look at where we started, when I started my career, no cell phones, everything was, you know, we just had the push button phone introduced when I started. I can't imagine what, um, what telecom and the resulting impacts on people's lives is gonna be even five years from now. Because, you know, all the things you talk about, autonomous vehicles and those sorts of things, that's, that is uh, gonna, that is not possible without the telecom. So, so trying to keep, back to your question, trying to keep the company up to speed on these technology changes, bringing in the talent that you need to do that. We were on the leading edge, and I, you know, I'm not I'm trying not to blow Verizon's horn uh, too much here, but we were on the leading edge of 4G. People said, you know, they're, they're way early. They haven't even been as kind in 5G. They thought we'd lost our minds. But we have been on the leading edge of that. And so convincing our investors that we're going to take capital and put it into that, something that's, you know, there wasn't even a standard for 5G when we started on that. Convincing our employees that we ought to reduce expenses in other areas so we can put uh, capital in this area. And then uh, building the capabilities of the organization has been, um, has been a challenge. But, you know, my view always was, what's the point of getting out of bed in the morning if you're doing the same stuff all the time? You know, you want to be doing something that's, you know, I don't want to be as dramatic as change the world. I do believe 5G is going to change the world. But, you know, why be boring? You might as well, you might as well go to work on something that's going to matter. And the people in the telecom industry, and I'd say Verizon specifically, have a reason to get up every day. So I want to talk a little bit. You alluded to the workforce issue. And being on the leading edge of that technology, it required you to make dramatic changes in workforce. I think there's a much broader discussion right now about how automation generally is going to yeah. influence workforce. But you took a workforce of 210,000 down to 150 and made a number of other, I mean, when you don't have lines, you don't need as many linemen. Um, right. But this deeply upset a lot of the workers who were being transitioned. And um, I guess that's a nice way of saying laid off. I mean, Fired. Um, yeah. You had strikes. You had people marching in front of your house, and you know, I'm sure that I, we've never talked about this, but that must have been a pretty painful experience. Yeah, I mean, I literally, I had people lighting fires to the trees in my front yard, you know. And uh, but, but I, I all I could do in that case was, yeah, I. There have been enough examples, and I'm, I've, I've got a great network of, of uh, friends who are CEOs. And I was able to use examples of, uh, you know, I, the example I use in the business, in, inside the business is we're a shark. And if a shark ever stops swimming, they die. And so you've got to keep moving forward. Um, I was friends with Rick Wagner, and I'm friends with Mary Barra. And I, you know, I was out during those strikes. I was out on the picket line talking to the employees. The union leadership hated it. Uh, I think we've got a better relationship with them now, but I needed to explain to them that, yeah, I understand this is painful. We'll figure out a way, and by the way, we've got job security and all those things that sink a lot of companies, but we were able to do 
uh, in as humane a way as possible, including retraining and those sorts of things. And the bottom line is, you know, if the company goes out of business, it doesn't. You're, you're not going to be in in good in a good position. So I use General Motors as an example. BlackBerry is another example. It was very similar, and they were the dominant player. They didn't evolve, and they died. So. I think you've got to be you got to be visible. You got to be willing to take the hits, and I still take those. I went to the Alfred Smith dinner the other day. I got out of my out of my car, and we had just done a five-year extension with the union. I thought it would be great. There were protesters there say, "Lol, you're a pig." You know, give the, give your employees a good contract. So I, okay, thanks very much. I got it. But uh, but the company, and you know, my view is the company, our employees that are there, and our shareholders and our customers are better off uh, when you have to make these changes. You just have to do the, the tough thing. You mentioned the importance of um, some peers, you know, the cliche of business being lonely. H how important has it been to have a network of colleagues in terms of your ability to both be creative but also sustain the, the hard choices? Yeah, well look, I I've been extremely fortunate. Um, um, Ivan Seidenberg was my predecessor. He uh, has been a mentor to me. Chuck Lee was before them. The management team that we have, um, their friends as well as colleagues. Craig Silliman's here in the front row. I go into his office and say, "Okay, Craig, this is a what do we do?" And you know, I, I like to listen to people's other points of view. The buck stops with me. And so Hans Vestberg uh, was one of my outside um, mentors. Uh, he's about um, ten years younger than I am, but. Uh, and I, I and I think that's important. You need to um, you need to be you need to open yourself up to anybody in the organization to give you views. But I used to go visit Hans twice a year when he was running Ericsson and ask him, you know, cultural issues. He's dealing. Europe is far more, you know, socialist, progressive, whatever you want to say, and we're moving that direction. Okay, what did you see? What do we see here in the states? And then I talked Hans into coming to work for Verizon. So. And now he's the new CEO. So I, I, my view is, and we say this in the credo, which is our, our uh, culture statement for the company, a good idea can come from anywhere. And I'm a big believer in that. I think part of the problem with what's going on in Washington now is we think that only the good ideas are the things that rattle around in our head. And you know, my belief is that a good idea can come from anywhere. We say that publicly. You just got to listen enough to hear from it. And so. You know, when I talk to Mary or Roger Penske is a good friend, Tim Cook is a good friend, we sit and talk about what it's like to be in the corner office and some of the issues they come up with, and that's how you become a better, a better CEO. So, kind of one more question, a little internal facing. Um, global company in every state in this country, we are watching now divisions, um, geographic divisions, gender divisions, significant different outlooks based on age. You had employees of all character. Did you have to think about that? I mean, did you think about you know, what it was like to have 20-year-old you know, employees and 70-year-old employees, and were you able to speak to everybody in one voice? Did you have active efforts to engage generations or genders yeah, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of efforts in, in this area. So. Um, this to me is not a program. You know, programs die. You do this because it makes your business successful. Um, and one of those voices that I always listen to is a lady named Judy Spitz. She was the um, chief op or chief information officer in one of our enterprise groups. And Judy said to me one day, "Lowell, you can't win this game if you leave half of your team on the bench." And she was referring to women in that case. And, um, and I'll admit, I, I had two brothers, and our entertainment was beating the hell out of each other. And um, I, so my mom was very strong, but I didn't know really how to deal with women in the workforce. And um, you know, early on, I went to a couple of them. Some of them I'm still extremely close with that have long since retired. And I said, all right. I just said this, it pissed you off. Why did, why did what I say, why did that? And so I just had to get inside their head and I've had, I still have mentors um, on the team and in the company that, you know, okay, if I say it this way, is that, 
going to cause a problem. So, you know, without, without being, I think you can, if you take this to the extreme, you can become paralyzed, so you can't do that. But so we, we have uh, employee resource groups, whether it's, uh, whether it's female or LGBTQ or Asian Americans, I mean, uh, African Americans, we have all of those. And, and uh, we make every one of our senior team mentors one of those groups. And then we meet with them and I get in front of them and I talk about what's going on in the business. I hear from the senior folks, what's on their mind, what are we doing to help? And that helps us deal with controversies. You know, like I, the, the whole bathroom issue as an example was a big, you know, a big to do, lots of things in the media. And you know, we went to those folks and said, well, okay, so what's the issue? What do we need to do? And so we have some gender, gender neutral bathrooms in the company, but they've helped us avoid some of these. I don't want to be inwardly focused. If a company becomes inwardly focused, then you lose. You've got to focus outward on your competition. And I think that's part of the problem in Washington right now is we're so darn internally focused. We aren't doing the things we need to do to be successful in the world. And I think uh, businesses can't afford to do that. If you do that, your results go right down. You end up being uh, going into bankruptcy or getting um, you, know, this, you get a new CEO. So that's part of the challenge that, that I have to deal with. So let's let's make that transition a little bit to the kind of outward focus and roles of business leaders. There's a very significant conversation today about environment, social governance, corporate social responsibility. Um, I think as the federal government steps back from some of its regulatory um, ideas, you're seeing more people look to corporations, to whether it's climate change or nutrition, guns issue. Um, why don't you dig in on this a little bit, uh, maybe first talk about what, what is the appropriate role for a corporate leader? You know, are there boundaries that you think are definable? And then maybe if you can reflect on some of your experiences, and we talked a little bit about you know, post-Charlottesville. Um, yeah. Just broadly, how, how do you see the role of a CEO in being a public policy leader? Well, we can we could spend the rest of our time talking about this, and I think it's probably the most important topic uh, we have here. Uh, as a as a CEO, you're really torn. Um, and I, I was sharing uh, with Jason backstage that the UN has put out a set of metrics that uh, they think responsible corporations should adhere to. And um, and I was given those because people said Verizon is doing these things. We. We are very focused on our carbon footprint. We've already cut our carbon footprint in half over the last three years. We're going to cut it in half again. Um, we are very involved in education. I don't know this to be a fact, but I've been told um, our commitment of $400 million uh, to improve uh, the tech use of technology and the curriculums for schools um, and touching 3 million students is the biggest single uh, gift or commitment on education of any company in the world. Now, I don't know that to be true, but that's what I've been told. So, I mean, we do, and I can go through a whole bunch of examples like that. You mentioned the Bipartisan Council on, on Medical. We do that because it's the right thing to do. We give back to the community because it's the right thing to do. But I will tell you, I took that UN, I, I've been taking Hans around and introducing him to our largest investors. I took that list of UN things to them and I said, what do you guys think about that? And they basically said they could care less. That's not what they're interested in. That's not what they expect of me. When I took over, the Verizon stock was $26. It is 57 yesterday. That's the one thing that our investors care about. So what you've got to do as a CEO is hopefully your values are such that you're going you're gonna to do both. We talk about in, inside the company being a growth and profitability company. At my senior team, we talk about being those things plus a good corporate citizen. Now, I do believe the millennials are looking more at that you know, with the, with the scars that I have uh, from over the years. I don't know that that really drives their purchase behavior. Perhaps it does. Um, but um, we're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. So in terms of the scope of your engagement, the investment in education with your technology is an authentic expression of your expertise in a way that few companies could match. 
your carbon footprint is your carbon footprint. The guns issue is a little different. Right? Yeah, I mean, it you is. Know, what's your, does Verizon have a direct engagement with gun purchasing, gun production? I mean, is, is it inside the you know, bound, you know, boundaries no, of the business? No, you know, and that's an interesting thing, and it'll be interesting to see how Hans uh, approaches that. But for me, I don't know that our customers or our investors are wanting Verizon to take a stand on an issue like that. It has nothing to do with our expertise. Um, we don't sell guns. We don't service guns. We have nothing to do with guns. Our expertise is around providing broadband to more people. So if I'm going to take a stand and use the corporate weight around something, it's going to be trying to get technology to improve enough that you can do rural broadband. That will do more to help more people than me taking a stand on, on guns. And by the way, big debate within the uh, company, uh, big debate around the leadership team. This is one where the buck stops with me. I'm not an avid gun person. I don't hate guns either. You know, so that makes it a little bit easier for me. But if I take a stand on guns, half of my customer base is going to be mad at me, and half of, us are, of them are going to think it's the right thing. So what do I add? I don't really add. It's just another voice. And if you allow, if a company allows itself to be a political foil for every issue that comes up, I mean, good God, in the press today, I mean, they're going to find something to get, and I, and I won't turn into a press bashing thing, but they're going to find something to be outraged over. And if I get outraged over everything that they're outraged over, who's paying attention to providing good wireless service to our customers? And to me, that's where we ought to spend time, and, that's, and we ought to try to build the future. And, and by the way, let's be honest about it. The education thing is somewhat self-serving to Verizon as well, because I need software engineers. I need more women engineers. I need more people of color that are doing engineering. So if I go in and put the effort that we're putting into of bringing these folks up through the uh, organization, it helps Verizon, it helps the economy, uh, it helps the country. So, um, you know, it is a little bit self-serving, so I don't, you know, want to sound like I'm Pollyanna here either. So let's probe a little more of this um, kind of UN criteria, because, I, you know, so we're thinking a lot about this question of ESG and corporate governance's capacity to act on those incentives. But fundamentally, we think about incentives, right? When, when yeah. people talk about political courage, what that usually means is taking a vote that angers your constituents yeah. for a broader national goal. And you know, we're trying to find ways to make it possible for people to do that um, more often. But the incentives that you described quickly were the hedge fund short-term quarterly profits. Um, yeah, well, most of our investors are really more, much more long-term. Uh, than they are. I mean, we're not we're not an activist stock. So I, you know, it's even even the long term people though are more interested. Their view is, give me an incremental dollar on the stock. I'll figure out what to do with the money. Mm -hmm. I don't need you to do that. But there is a there is a growing debate, which is a little different than the kind of core ESG about wages, investment in technology, the kinds of longer term choices that companies arguably used to be able to make more or chose to make more, more investments in community. Um, and I wonder, you know, not just based on Verizon's experience, but broadly, do you buy the notion that the current, you know, I'll call it short-termism that, you know, is dominant across many investors, does that affect CEO incentives and choices in a oh, way? No, no, no question. Um, I think it does. So the difference for Verizon is that we are, uh, the, the, as I said, the cycle is shortening, but we are a seven-year capital company. So a dollar we invest today will earn for us over about seven years. The, a lot of the companies that you're talking about are, are, are much shorter term. We're a long capital, return on capital company. You know, and I, I think the, Jason, I think the problem today is we are, such a Reader's Digest or a Twitter handle uh, country now, nobody wants to take the time to understand why you're doing what you're doing. They very quickly just want to condemn you. 
You know, they, your results were either good or bad, and they don't understand that, okay, you're investing now, and it's going to turn positive in two years, and here's the reason why. So um, I've had people say, what on earth are you investing $400 million of our money into education for? Well, they just want to see $400 million. It's not into a network thing, so you shouldn't be doing it. Well, no, if you think about building the capabilities. So there's a number of things like that that the CEO has to just say, you know, I, I hear you, and you do need to hear them because, as I said right in the very beginning, you learn things from people you don't expect to learn things from. But you've got to have the moral courage to say, I got that, but you're not in my chair, and um, and I see it differently, and try to explain why. But at the end of the day, I you know I'm I'm doing this. I don't care. And if you don't want me in the chair, get me out of the chair. I always used to say I wasn't looking for a job before I got this one, and I won't probably look for the next one. So uh, you have to be in that position. That's why one of our our head of HR says, "Are you paying? Are you playing for the name on the front of the jersey or the name on the back of the jersey?" And the minute you start uh, playing for the name on the back of the jersey, you, you, lose your, you lose your right to make decisions like that that are unpopular. That's a, that's a nice metaphor. Um, talk a little bit about organizational culture. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we have 149,900 less employees than you. Um, but still, you know, culprit, you know, organizational culture is really a big conversation. For us, I think it's driven even more by what's happening outside of these walls. And so I think as we talk about core institutions and traditions and principles, we try to make sure that we are applying them to ourselves. Um, but you made some pretty bold acquisitions. And there's this idea of the, you know, corporate America or nonprofits. The diversity in culture among corporations is exotic. Was that an issue for you? When you looked at a corporation, did you look at their culture? When you brought a new company in, were there integration issues that were meaningful? Oh, oh, oh God, yes. <laughs> I guess this is my answer there. So I, I have to take you back, and Tom Talkie's here, he'll remember this. When we formed Verizon back in 99, nobody was given a job, but I don't know, 10 or 15 of us were brought into the room, and assignments were, were given out. And you got, you know, okay, you're, you lead a team that's gonna work on systems, you lead a team that's gonna work on network. They came around to me and they said, Lowell, you're going to lead a team that's going to focus on culture. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm fired. You know, they obviously don't have a job for me because they gave me something they don't care about. Well, as it turns out, and they told me later, that was the thing that they cared the most about. Mm -hmm. And we took the time, and the guy that worked with me is still here, and he works for me doing um, all employee communications, and we wrote something called the Credo which has been the cornerstone of our company's culture from day one. And it's, you know, if you read it, you'd say, okay, yeah, you don't live up to this. We don't, and we admit that every day, but it's what we aspire to. And we hold each other accountable. And I, I use the term all the time that culture is, an, is a muscle that you've got to exercise. So in the beginning it was, you know, and we still do this, by the way. We, we rec at every employee meeting, we recognize somebody that exemplifies the credo, and we talk about why. And the, the credo says things which, you know, you won't be surprised. It says an idea can come from anywhere in the company. It doesn't just come from senior management. That a clean store window is more important than a corner office. I mean, it's, it's the sort of things that... Uh, mm -hmm that we've talked about this morning. And we, when, uh, when I look at an acquisition, we have walked away from businesses that, that the culture just doesn't, doesn't fit. And one of the first things we do when we bring a new company in, like Yahoo and AOL, is we get up there, and oftentimes it's me or it's the business unit head that's going to be managing that. And we, we say, this is the credo. This is why it's important. And one of the lines is integrity is at the core, core of who we are. And, um, and if you violate the integrity, you're out. It's just, you're out. We don't have a problem, for example, with things, well, I shouldn't say this because immediately we find we will. He's but, never missed an extra point in his yeah, whole career. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's, I can give you many examples where um, a, a male boss has made an advance on a female colleague and he is gone the next day, gone. Just, it's, it's right there in the credo. We treat everybody with respect. So, um, 
So the things that you mentioned about an ESG, about giving back to the community is in there. You know, building our talent, collaboration is in there. One of my favorites is our best was good for today, tomorrow we'll do better. And it's, um, that is the, the essence of no matter how good you're doing or no matter how bad you're doing, you can always do better. And, and I think that sets the tone around the business. So I think if I had to go back, what was the one single thing that I'm most proud of in the business? It's that credo and how it has established the culture of the business and, and given people the milestones and the guideposts about what it's like to be part of Verizon. So uh, I have one more question. I want to open this up in a minute. I think we find that some people like to write questions down. Some people like to raise their hands. So there are some cards if your preference is uh, to uh, use penmanship, uh, please try to make it readable. Um, so, well, my last question is, um, has your on-demand ever seized up, and have you ever called the 1-800 number to get um, <laughs> service? For, for, our, for, the, for yeah. Verizon? Yeah. Oh, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, so I'm kind of uh, legendary or infamous or whatever it is around the company for, Long before there was an undercover boss thing, I would, my favorite thing was to go out to a store. I have, a, I have an ID that gets me into every location in the company. So whether it's a central office or it's a store, I'll show up you know, 15 minutes before opening and stand out in the rain and see if anybody opens the door and lets me in. Or I'll, uh, I, I loved, when I was chief operating officer, I loved going into a call center getting a bunch of reps together, going into a conference room and just listen to calls. Listen to people take calls. Okay, what was good about it? What was bad about it? Most of them were bad, I have to say. I mean, I, you know, I, I always found that opportunity to do better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I mean, if you, you know, that's, that was again my early point and it's part of picking fruit with uh, the migrant workers in Western New York is if you're not out on the front line that one of my favorite sayings is the most dangerous view of your company is the view from behind your desk. And I've tried to, I've tried to be out, out there as much as I can. I hasn't, haven't been able to do it as much, but you know, there's lots of stories about visits where you know, I terminated people on the spot. I had people cuss me out and then I showed them my ID card and they just said, okay, I'll clean my desk out now. <laughs> so that's, not a, that's, that's a good thing, I think. All right, so um, if people want to pass some cards up, that would be great. And uh, I will uh, ask you to uh, introduce yourself. And we have some mic runners. I think Mark is up here, up front. I'll talk loud to start. Uh, my name is Mark Walsh. I'm actually on the board, board of the BPC. What are some examples, if any, where you were happy the FCC existed and some examples where you wish they didn't exist and its role in your regulation? Boy. Our Craig Silliman, our general counsel, is sitting in the front row, and he's going, oh, my God. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, I'll just say this. I believe, I believe you do have to have some regulation. Um, so I'm not a uh, complete free market person. But the example that I give is our industry is a full motion, high definition movie. It's moving incredibly fast. And the best a regulator can do is take one of those old Polaroid pictures. You know, they'll take a snapshot, they go through the process of designing a regulation and you know, think about your, how, the, how the picture used to materialize slowly. I'm dating myself. A lot of you are going, what's he talking about? Anyway, by the time the regulation gets done, the business has moved on. And so you end up with a lot of unintended consequences. And, um, you know, our, our, back in the day, you know, the, this, this uh, Title II thing that just went on, I mean, back in the day when it was AT&T and Verizon and it was a more of a monopoly, it didn't move that much. But now, I mean, Facebook's a partner and a competitor. Google's a partner and a competitor. We're in their space. They're in our space. It is just so complicated now that I don't think you can codify it and uh, make a regulation that's going to stick and incent what you want to have incented. So um, I believe you know what Bill Clinton did in the Telecom Act of '96 spurred 
the investment that you saw in that subsequent decade. And if you look at that, uh, that and Tom knows this more, much more than I do, but it had a set of standards without being over restrictive. And I think that uh, that was very good for the economy. So that's the, without being too specific, that's sort of my point of view. Craig is nodding approvingly, so that's well handled. Um, I want to know what Tom thinks. <laughs> Some other questions? Hello, my name is Astrid Ruiz from a private company at Boos. Um, the communications network industry plays a leadership role for achieving more equitable and inclusive economic development. Sub-Saharan Africa is a perfect example of how this can play out. Um, so I have two questions. How is it that the telecom industry in Africa has been able to contribute to bridging the gap between urban uh, rural poverty, uh, I mean the rural urban gap and poverty reduction, much better than in, in the U.S. And um, what two things would you do today that you didn't in the past to achieve a better balance between the company's responsibility to the shareholders and its social responsibility? Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, that's an interesting um, example, and I think there's a lot to be learned from that, and I'll, I'll make an assumption on the question a little bit, but, well, Vodafone was our partner for a number of years, and um, they had a lot of assets in Africa, so I got a little bit of an insight there. And I, I think the beauty of Africa is they bypassed the copper network. They bypassed putting an individual line from the central office to everybody's individual home, and they went to wireless. Uh, if you look at generations of technology, at least the cost to serve drops by a factor of 10. I think that as we go from 4G to 5G, I expect the cost to serve would, would go down by a factor of 20. So by them uh, uh, avoiding running the copper and going to wireless, they were able to get that advantage that much quicker. And if you take a look, if you go way back to the history of the Bell system, it was the same thing. The, the, the urban areas were covered first because they could get to them. It wasn't until we did the rural electrification and those, some of the other telecom acts that we got out into the rural. So I'm hopeful 4G has certainly gotten data out into the rural areas better but the cost to serve is still 20 times what it'll be on 5G. I'm hoping, and, it, and that's not obvious right now, but I'm hoping that 5G will allow us to get out there um, into those rural areas. So if I had to do something different, um, I think we, um, and it gets a little bit back to the regulation question, the, uh, the rural, the, the incentives for rural service had so many regulations tied to them that we as a company made the decision we weren't going to go do that. And I think I, if I had to do it again, I'd be a little bit more of a vocal, um, I guess, critic of what would need to change in those regulations to truly incent people to go out there. So um, we have taken a leap in New York State here in the last year to take some of those funds and go in and try to do more broadband in the rural areas of New York, which is sort of in our footprint. But I think that's got to be done more, and that's one of the things that uh, we are pushing on, and I wish I'd pushed harder. Question here that I will read, and then we have time for uh, one or two more. Um, I believe I'm reading this right. It says, I am an old bellhead. The first uh, I know what that means. vowel Nobody in the word bell. Okay. Um, and the question is, um, are there ways in which your leadership style has you know, differed from either Ray or Ivan? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, look, um, Hans gets asked that question a lot. And I think you just got to respect that, um, that you're, a, you're a bit of a product of your environment. So Hans, growing up in a socialist country, um, you know, he's a, very involved in the UN, was not in the military, perspective is different than mine. Ivan's is probably closer to mine because he was in the military, he came up through the ranks and the, and the telco, but, um, you know, and I, I love Ivan. I, he's, you know, I mean, I, 
he's, I think, one of the greatest executives um, in, in the country, and I have a lot to learn uh, from him. But he came up more from an operations, and he came through regulatory. He spent a lot of time in Washington. I was an operations guy. From day one, I was a network engineer. I came up through that side of the house, so we've put a little bit different emphasis on different parts of the organization. And then I think just, um, you know, generationally you're different. You know, Ivan's another 10, 12 years older than I am, and Hans is 10 years younger than I am. So I think you just, you, ought, you automatically get those sorts of changes. And, and I, um, I was a bit irreverent, so the, the bellhead in the room, since I know what that means. Um, you know, the first day I showed up on the, um, the job in Costa Mesa, Mesa as an outside engineer, they literally put a stack of documents on my desk that were that high. And they said, those are the Bell System practices. Read those, it will tell you how to do your job. I mean, nobody ever asked you to think. They just said, do it according to the book. Well, that, I mean, that's, you know, you, you, you couldn't create and destroy those documents fast enough, in my view. So, you know, I'm much more of a seat of the pants. I'm a process guy. I'm a let's see what customers need, and let's do that. And, and you know, I'm not saying Ivan was that way, but that was the bell system was, you know, do these, do what it says in this document, and you'll be fine. And a lot of people were, but those are the ones that died along the way. So I have a final question, but there's time for one more. If... Uh... All right, I, Lauren, you jumping in? All right, I read the room right. So, um, first of all, thank you and your voice for uh, <laughs> holding on. Um, so, my final question is just, you know, as broadly as um, you imagine, what's something that you are optimistic about and something you're pessimistic about? Well, it would probably be stem from the same thing. Um, I'm optimistic that the technology that we see coming can dramatically change the world for the better. And, and I'll give you a couple of examples on that. Um, with the capacity of the networks that we have and the performance around things like latency, virtual reality will allow in education someone to take a course from the best mind in the world and really be immersed in that education experience. You will be able to see a specialist or the rural question. You'll be able to have the best doctors literally operate on you from thousands of miles away with these networks. We'll be able to slash the carbon footprint the quality of the food supply will be better. The transportation system will be light years ahead of what it is today. I'm optimistic that that, that can happen. The pragmatist in me, or the pessimist in me, is worried about what people will do with that technology if they turn it to, to bad uses. And the... Um, that's why I think the moral compass, what concerns me is the moral compass that we see in the, you know, in the media, in, the, um, in politics and those sorts of things, left to their own devices. I worry about how that technology will be used as a weapon uh, instead of for, for good. And um, you know, that's something that I hope to spend some of my personal effort on in retirement, and I think leaders of uh, the Business Council, leaders of Verizon, AT&T, others, um, and obviously the Silicon Valley companies, they're going to have to really step up to if, uh, if this technology will have the positive impact that it can and really should, and I'd, I'd take it further, that it has to have um, on our society and on the planet. I want to ask everyone to uh, join me in thanking Lowell. your willingness to really reflect on your own life experiences and help us think about how things like the credo might apply to our democracy, I think is something that we really value. And I just want to thank you for coming. Thank you, Jason.